Well, good morning, everyone. I've got a really good study today, something that I've been anxious to get recorded so that I could share with some people that are going through trials. Um, there's this wilderness testing period. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a time when, uh, when the, uh, the church is coming in to this new earth and also coming into the end of time that matches or there, there's a type or any type of, uh, of, of this, this wilderness period. It's, and so we're the, this is, the time is the anti-type. And so this, what we can see is that there's something that we can learn. There's a pattern of, of what God is doing with the church like He did with Israel. And um, there, is a, there is a wilderness testing that needs to be evaluated. Now, this wilderness testing time was two years. Uh, it was from the time that he delivered Israel out of Egypt until the time that he, they sent spies into the land and they come back and filled their tenth and final time. And then it was over. They did not get to enter in. But uh, this is very important to see how God does his business because those, the two people that were faithful that did inherit the promise, well, guess what? He restored to them everything they lost. They didn't even age while they were in there, uh, while they were in the uh, wilderness march. And so just like there's a wilderness testing period before we go into the tribulation, which would have been their 40-year march. Well, Revelation 12 talks about a wilderness period where the church is, is, is carried away to a place that God prepares where He feeds them and nurtures them until that three and a half or 1260 days is over. Three and a half years or 1260 days. 42 months, it's all the same time period. And so this wilderness testing is a time just right before that tribulation time when, when the church is hidden and took care of. And so there will be people in that tribulation time that, that uh, belong to God that will be protected. There will be others that didn't make the cut that will die during that time. And so is a, there's a parallel of that kind of thing because they didn't have the faith to enter into the promised land. And so we want to look at the wilderness testing because simply because the Scriptures teach us that all that stuff was recorded to prepare us for when it happens again. There's a time for this to happen. Is everything okay? All right. So we see uh, the, the rest that remains for Joshua's and the Caleb's of our day. There's still some people like, like Joshua and Caleb that he's looking for. And so in Hebrews chapter 3 it says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And so when we look at what he's saying is that Christ is, is the son over his own house, we're, we're of Christ's household. And uh, he says, if, we're, we're of his household, if we do this, we hold fast the confidence. See, the confidence and the rejoicing, the hope, the joy that we find in Jesus, this, this confidence, that's our faith and firm reliance upon what he has said. See, we've got to hold that firm until the end. So we don't, we don't shake that. We don't lose that. Uh, but to the very end of this testing time, we have a firm confidence and we can have a joy because of the things that He's told us and we know that His promises are true. And so He says that wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today if you will hear His voice, now this is important because He's showing that this promise is current. Because the Holy Ghost said today, this is a standing promise. If you will hear His voice today, He, he gives us the warning, harden not your hearts as is in the provocation. And the provocation was this wilderness testing time where they provoked God to anger in the day that of the temptation or the day of trial. This word should have been trial, trial in the wilderness. And so this is what happened, is that they, they were under trial, but instead of, instead of passing their test, they tempted God or tested God. And so the idea was that if they murmured and complained and, and talked about how bad God was acting, that He might perform for them and do whatever they want. Well, that's not how you get things from God. That's not how you get results from God. The way you get results from God is by humbling yourselves and becoming obedient and submitting to Him. And then, then you get everything. He gives you everything that He has to give. So they were provoking God uh, and during their trial in the wilderness. So this is that two years that we're talking about. So He says, when your fathers tempted me, see this, they were testing me and proving me, and they saw all my works, even during the 40 years. So they saw all the works, the miracles that He worked in Egypt. And He will work a miracle in your life too. And so he worked, he, they saw the miracles He worked in Egypt. They saw the miracles that He worked during the two years of testing. And then they saw the miracle of the bread falling from heaven for 40 years. 
And you know what? They got that bread every day, every day, every day, except the Sabbath for 40 years until the day that they entered into Canaan and ate of the fruit and it stopped falling. Faithful right to the time he brought them to the land of flowing with milk and honey. They didn't need it anymore. That is our God right there. He is faithful. He's saying, you saw my miracles, but then you wanted to test me and prove me, and try to get me to perform by acting crazy. And he said it didn't work. They, they went into the wilderness to die for that. And only Joshua and Caleb, who didn't behave that way, they, they got everything. They got what they lost by marching for 40 years back, and they got everything else, everything that God wanted to give these children. So he says that he was grieved. This is what was happening to God. He could not get them to submit. So he was grieved with that generation. And they said they do always err in their heart. Their heart wasn't right. And they, they didn't know his ways. They wouldn't learn. And in the beginning, you know, he didn't just give up on them in the beginning. He tried to turn everything into a teaching moment. And we're going to look at what him trying to do that in a moment. But he said that they, they erred in their hearts. They didn't know his ways and they wouldn't learn them. They would not come to him and learn the way. But if you do, he'll make it worth your while. The rewards that God has to give are so great. And so he says, he says, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And so he said, take heed, brethren. This is where he begins to show. This is a standing promise. Today, if you'll hear his voice, you need to take, to take heed, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Now see, that's what he's saying is what happens is during the testing time, the heart departs from God. And it's because of unbelief that it departs. It turns to sin because it's not relying and believing in God's promises that He can work these miracles today, that He will work these miracles today if we will learn what He wants us to learn. But as we see in the Scriptures, the double-minded man is not going to receive anything. See, that's what was written in James, and we'll look at that before we're through. It's a matter of coming in here not having a heart of unbelief that departs from God, but, but to, not to err, but to come to know His ways. Don't be like this. He says he was grieved with that generation. They erred. They didn't know his ways. They didn't. He says now they didn't inherit the rest. And he says take heed lest that happens to you. So he's applying everything from what happened in this wilderness time to us today. Like he said today if you'll hear his voice don't let this happen to you. And he says but what you need to do is exhort one another daily why it's called today. Now listen, he says, because this is how we get out of it. This is how we get out of Satan's snares is by sharing with each other, hearing the word of God, encouraging one another. He says, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now this is important too, because he's saying that sin can be so deceitful that you work it out where you can introduce the sin into your life and, and it's okay, but it's not okay. What happens is a hardening takes place and you have a breach between you and God that's why there's no help coming your way. And so sin has deceived you and you've become hardened to it and you've got this practice in your life that is, it's not a stalemate, you're just going to lose. You're just going to lose. You either submit to God and humble yourself under His hand or you're just going to lose. It's not a stalemate. And so we have things to learn here. And he says we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now look, this is what he's talking about here with this last verse. Faith in the end does not diminish from what it was when it started. And that's what he's saying, that we are partakers of Christ, whatever he has to give us, if we hold the beginning of our confidence, that's the faith reliance upon God, that it's the, that it's the same in the beginning as it was in the end. We don't need to, we don't need to, to lose all that as we go through our testing. And so there's repentance and getting back up. The children of Israel had that opportunity, but they wouldn't. And that's why he called them stiff-necked. It's because they wouldn't learn. They wouldn't get up and change. They wouldn't repent. Okay? Now, as we continue to look at this, we want to show this offer stands today in Hebrews 3, verse 7 through 19. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, and so this is when they were provoking God, as we said before, their hearts got hardened and they just kept provoking God over and over and over and over and it never changed. They didn't repent. They didn't su su submit to God. So he says, For some, when they heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. We know Joshua and Caleb were different. 
And so he's saying two. When he says not all, he's saying two. Two people from the old, from the grown-ups, and everyone 20 years, uh, 20 years and upward died, 19 and down, they went in with Joshua and Caleb. And so they got tested too as they were coming in. But they had to, they had to do better than their fathers or they wouldn't inherit it either. They, got, they had to send spies in just like their fathers did. And they had to come back and do what he said. And he wouldn't explain it himself either. You have to, to, to do this. When you see the ark going forward, you have to get in behind it. And you, you, you march around that city. What? Why? Never mind why. You have to follow God. Follow Him. And then you just trust Him. Follow Him. Do. And so they went in because the children did that. But they knew what happened to their fathers. And they knew why it happened. See, they had 40 years to think about it. Okay? And so it says, But whom was he grieved? It was them that had sinned. Now this is important too. As we look at this, Joshua and Caleb, they had a different spirit. They weren't acting like them. So he says that he was grieved with them that sinned. Now this is important because the sin is not the unbelief. The sin is what happened because they didn't believe. And so this is the thing. When you believe God's promises, you won't turn to sin. Okay? He was grieved with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom he sware that, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. And so they, believed, they didn't believe, so they misbehaved. They sinned against God. They proved God. They tested God. And they, they, they did many, many terrible things every time they were tested. Said many terrible things every time they were tested. So he says in the end, you see, that they could not enter in because their unbelief, their unbelief led to sinful behavior. I mean, and it just it really kind of culminated at the golden calf. And we'll look at just how bad they were willing to sin because of their unbelief. Okay? So, this is what we want to sum up. Today we look at Israel's unbelief, which manifested as sin. Sin is rebellion against God's commandment. And that's all that sin is. It's like when you allow a sin into your life, you're breaking His commandment. And so you're on that sin that you're practicing, it is rebellion. You're doing the same thing the angels did. Rebelling. You have to surrender. His commandments are given to us to obey. You have to keep them. And so you can't just be in rebellion to God. So he's saying that this is what happened to them. They rebelled, and he's going to call them rebellious as well. So we're looking at Israel's unbelief that manifested as sin. Sin is rebellion against one of God's commandments, or all of them, or, or God himself. And he says, if you have a sin practice, you're in rebellion to that, to that particular commandment. So Israel words and, Israel's words and works demonstrated their unbelief, and that's all that happened there. Just as words and works demonstrate the faith of Joshua and Caleb. They talked different. They behaved different. They acted like they knew what they were going to get. Okay? And the others acted like they didn't believe they were going to ever get what God said. Okay? Now, a promise left for us. Again, we're going to continue chapter 4 of Hebrews and just continue to follow this line of thought. He said, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left to us. So he's saying that this same promise that they had is left to us of entering into his rest, and any of you should seem to come short of it. Now we'll talk about what that means a little bit in a moment. There's layers of this fair's promise. Okay? And so he says, For to us was the gospel preached, and he said there was some good news given to us, just like it was to them. They got a promised land, we got a promised land. And as well as unto them, but the word preached to them didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So they, they didn't believe what God said, and so they didn't act like they believed what God said. They just wanted to act, to act in a terrible way to try to get God to perform for them. And it didn't work. They died for that. And so he says, For we which have believed do enter the rest. And so we have to believe. We're, we're conducting ourselves like someone that believes that God is faithful and will deliver and do all that he has said. He says, So we which have believed do enter the rest, as he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath. Now look, this is just a translation from, from, from Hebrew to Greek to English of what's being said here. This word if is the best they could do. But what this means is, this word if, it just means that God had made them a conditional promise when he sent Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. And he was saying that if you believe, and if you conduct yourself as someone that believes, then you can enter my rest. And if you don't, you won't. And so this is the best they could do with that is just by putting the if in there. And so that's what he said. The promise, the promise was you can enter if you believe and act like it, and you can't if you don't believe and act like it. 
And so that's what this, this is what this comes down to. And so he says, He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now the ideal here is, is that God created the world in six days. And the seventh day he rested. Well, 6,000 years ago, he created the earth. And there's a 7,000th year, there's a thousand years of rest. And he's saying that there's some Joshua's and Caleb's that's going in there with some kids. He wants that. He wanted that to be some of us. But it's the same test. It's the same exact thing. He really is looking for those. Okay? And so, he wants that to be you. And so, he's saying that, that there's a rest here. That, uh, he, that he's been talking about where he rested from his works and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest showing that there's a rest that remains for the people of God and it's conditional whether you enter into it or not and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief and he says and he limited a certain day again saying in David because David wrote in the Psalms when he said this we've been reading about today after so long a time as it is said today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts as, it, as they did in the day of provocation. We just read that a moment ago. So this is what he's saying. David was already in the land of Canaan. And in the spirit, he starts talking about, don't harden your hearts. Today, if you'll hear his voice, he says you can enter into his rest. See? And so he's saying that that proves through the Holy Spirit that a rest remains for the people of God. And he, there's, he, that we have to go through this wilderness testing again, just like they did. Everyone has to go through it. Okay? So this is what he says. For if Joshua, now this word Joshua, Jesus should have been translated Joshua. The modern version, the only reason why I put that in there is to show you they, did, they got it right. So he's saying if Joshua had given them rest, there would not have afterward been spoken of another day. And so this is his conclusion, Hebrews 4, 4 verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. He's saying we're going through it again. And there's another rest waiting for us. And if you're a Joshua Caleb, you can have it. If you can't, you'll fall in the wilderness, just like they did. Okay? And so he says, For he that entered into his rest also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So he's saying there's a time of rest, and it's going to be good. You'll cease from your labors. It won't be like it is today. It'll be different where God provides. Okay? It'll be like the garden situation, a, a time of rest for a thousand years. And it's worth it. It's worth whatever we have to go through to prove ourselves because it's, it's, he's going to reward us a, a million times more than we could possibly imagine in that time. And so he says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. So the labor is not works, stars by your name. It's, it's your example of your faith. And this is what he says and here, Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So these labors are, are living your life as, as an example of someone who believes. He's saying acting out like you believe God, trust God every day. No matter what comes up in your face, it doesn't matter. Live it out like you believe God and trust God every day. This, we're, we're passing through enemy territory. And that is my next study, by the way. I'm just about done with it. And it's, it's fantastic. It's just that this world is the devil's kingdom. We have to pass through it with Jesus. And so he's saying that you've got to pass through this while he's coming after you. You've got to pass through this and live your life as an example of someone that has faith and trust and reliance upon God. And then you pray through it. And that's the whole armor of God right there. That's it from Ephesians 6. That's what we're supposed to learn while we're here. And so you need to have an example of belief, not an example of unbelief. Okay? So, in, so this is what we want to see from this. King David said in the Spirit, the promise was current. But he said, he said it after Israel had been in the land for many years. Canaan was a rest for God's people. The new earth is a rest for God's people. Heaven is a rest for God's people. So there's layers of this. There's layers of this. And this is what we want to look at, the types and the antitypes, okay? So God created heaven and earth in six days and rested on the seventh. The world was created 6,000 years ago, approximately, and, to enter, and we're about to enter into a thousand-year rest. And that's in Revelation chapter 20, okay? Israel was delivered from bondage and entered two years of testing. They marched, they marched 40 years through tribulation because they failed their testing. They marched 40 years through the tribulation in the wilderness and entered into the rest of the promised land after those that didn't believe died. So those that didn't believe entered into the promised land. Now this time, we, we, we hear from Revelation, from Revelation chapter 12, that, that the tribulation period is only three and a half years, 42 months. But 
there, there won't be any survivors of those that don't believe in that time. It'll be just like this. So Christians are delivered from the bondage of sin. Through tribulation and testing, they enter, in, in, they enter into God's rest in heaven. Or, it says we can see the, another layer. Before the return of Christ, Christians go through rigorous testing. And those who manifest the faith of Joshua and Caleb can be expected... Can, can expect to be protected and fed through the three and a half year tribulation period and enter into the rest of the new earth. So we see that in Revelation 12, Revelation 20. Okay? And so Canaan, the promised land, foreshadowed various levels of promises left to us, both the new earth and ultimately heaven itself, is remaining for those who have the faith of Joshua and Caleb. So that's our mission. Is, uh, as we pass through this enemy territory and we, we exhibit the faith and trust that Joshua exhibited to, to have the kind of miracles that, that, are, that we need to, to pass through this to work in our lives. And those miracles are available to us. I can tell you that. Okay? So every generation has a wilderness testing. Let's just look for a moment at what 1 Corinthians 10 says. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our, all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so he's, he's taking this parallel of what happened to them, what happens to what, with us. And he's saying that just like when Israel left Egypt, that God parted the Red Sea and there was a cloud overhead and it said they were baptized into Moses and came out. And so just like when we get baptized and begin our walk with Christ. They drank from a rock water, but we drink from Christ, the Holy Spirit, the living water. And so there's a parallel between what they did and what we're doing. And he says, with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And he says, now these things were our examples. He's saying you need to look at that and you need to take note of how you can be Joshua and Caleb because you're going to get the same fate that, the, that, the, that the, the other two million Israelites got if you don't have that faith. And so he's saying those were our examples to the, end that, the, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them, as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And neither let us commit fornication, showing some of the things they were involved in, as some of them committed and fell in one day, 20 and 3,000. Okay? So he's making this parallel to the Christian walk and, and, and their baptism to what they did when they come out of the Red Sea. So we go through a testing and we have a promise left to us of a rest, just like they did. And this, you know, this, this testing period is, is more rigorous because, because the 6,000 years is expiring. We're getting close to this tribulation period. So, so we are not to try to get God to act by disobedience and murmuring to provoke Him. And so this is what uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says, verse 1 through 13. Neither let us tempt... I guess we've looked at the, the verses uh, 1 through 9 already, or 1 through 8. So this is a continuation slide. Neither let us tempt... Now look, there's, there's two words here. There's actually three Greek words for tempt and test and try. And look, God doesn't tempt. James, James says God doesn't tempt any man with evil. He does not do that. He's not involved in that. Test us, He does. So these words are not interchangeable. And so this is one of the things I want to notice. When, it, when He's talking about trial, he, it's in a way that, that you can test God and that's wrong. That's a sin. Or He can test you and that's okay. Because that's how he finds out what kind of faith you have. But whenever a tempting is used, you being tempted of the devil or being tempted to do wrong, that's a word that's, that's, that's a completely different Greek word, and that's what Satan does to you. Satan brings temptation to your life. He brings, he brings that kind of things into your life for you to do wrong. Okay? And so what we want to see is what, what's going on here. As, as, uh, as we, look, we continue to look at 1 Corinthians 10, where he makes this parallel between what happened to Israel and what's happening to us in our lives. Okay? And so, so neither let us... He said these things are written for our examples now. Verse 1. He says, he says, neither let us tempt, or that means to try or put to the test, Christ. So you don't put Christ to the test by your behavior. That's not what you do. As some of them also tempted Him, or that should be tried. They tried Him. And they were destroyed, destroyed of uh, serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. So... Uh, Death angel passed through. A lot of them died of a plague because they were murmuring. They were complaining. Okay? Now all these things happened to them for examples 
and were written for our admonition on, the, on the, whom the ends of the world shall come. Wherefore let him thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. And there is no temptation. This word is trial. There's no trial that's happened to you. But what's common to man is what's happening to everybody. But God is faithful. This is where we become Joshua and Caleb. Who will not suffer you to be tried. See, above, or this word, even this word here, 3985, it's a different word. It is tempted. That's when the devil comes in while you're be down. So see, you're, you're ground down by trial. Well, he comes in to tempt you and try to make you start to do sin, to commit sin. He says he'll not allow you to be tried above what you're able, but with, with the temptation, the trial, he will make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And so we, want, we don't want to just use that word loosely. The King James Version does, so I don't pay any attention to it. I, I look at the Greek numbers to see what is a trial and what is a temptation, and that's what I do. And there's the three different words. Okay? King James Version mucks it up. The modern versions gets it right, though. You know... Um, whenever, like for example, in Jesus' prayer, pray that you not enter to temptation. That should, word should have been trial. Trial, say. So, this is the two years of testing from Egypt to Canaan. And uh, me and Brooke Perkins figured it up, just sit down and figured up how long they went through this uh, whenever he was in. And so this is the example of Israel's unbelief. The rest of this presentation will go very quickly and uh, because it's going to be just reading. Okay, it's not complicated doctrine like we've looked at in the first nine slides. Now, uh, the sum. This is what he did. This, this, Numbers 14 is actually the last thing God said to him where he said, you tempted me ten times. This is what he said about that. So he says, um, we're looking at Israel's, Israel witnessed God's power and glory and faithlessly imputed evil to God. That's what they were doing every time something bad happened. So because all those men, chapter 14... Verse 22, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me, that she tried, tried him now ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Now listen to what the problem is. They saw his miracles in Egypt. They saw the miracles during the two, the two years of temptation. And this is what he said. They, they seen my hand, how powerful it was. But this is the way they acted. They tested God. They tried to provoke Him to perform ten times and they didn't listen to anything He was commanding them. They were, they, were, they were not obeying Him. And so it just didn't matter. Whatever He would command them, there was disobedience. And so surely, He says, they shall not see the land which I swear to their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke Me see it. Now that's important because we can see by their behavior trying to provoke God to perform He's saying, provoking me is a bad sin. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and it followed me fully. Now you see the difference? Caleb followed him fully. That's why he got to go in. Him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. So Caleb was one of the twelve spies that went in there. So was Joshua. They both got to see the land of Canaan. It said they had a different spirit. They behaved differently than Israel did. They didn't murmur. They didn't complain. They never tried to provoke God to test, to test Him to perform. They never did that. They weren't involved in that. And so they went in to possess the, rest, the land of rest, and they didn't age. They, they were uh, 40 years old when they went and spied it. They were 80 when they went in, and He said, we're men of war at 80 years old. And they lived 120. They just got that 40 years back because we normally lived 80 years old. They just got it back. He restored it to them. That's what he did. And so, he said that because he followed him fully, he will go in and inherit it. And it says, The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? So this is what they were doing. They were murmuring and complaining. And the Lord said, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. So this is important because what he's saying is, whatever you were saying that I was doing and I wasn't, he said, now that's what I'm going to do. Whatever you were murmuring, that's what you're getting. Because it was evil. And so that was their punishment. Everything that they accused God of is what God was going to do to them. He wasn't doing that at the time. But he says, now that's what I'm going to do. Because you wrongly accused me of doing that. 
and that they would fall in the wilderness just like they were afraid of whenever they were accusing God of bringing them there to do that. Okay? He says, Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do unto you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Every one twenty years old and upward was old enough to know better. He said they were going to fall in the wilderness just like they were claiming that's what God brought them there for. Okay? But he goes on to tell them that their children, which were innocent, that they said were going to die in the wilderness. He said, no, I'm going to bring them into there, to the, to the land to possess it, but you won't possess it. Now, this is number one, imputing evil motives to God while God was planning their deliverance. So in Exodus 14, when Moses uh, delivered Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, now you know it took ten plagues to do that, and you know why? Because Moses is working miracles right there in front of Pharaoh, and he, wouldn't, he would not even consider that there were miracles. And it's the same today. If God gives you a dream or a vision or any such thing, and you just ignore that, he's, well, he's doing something that's supernatural with you, and you're like Pharaoh, you're hardening your heart. You're not paying attention to that. So it's the same thing. It took ten plagues to get him to, to, to let the people go. But even after he let him go, he come after him. And so when Pharaoh knew, drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid. Now this is the first thing that I want to show you. Them being afraid was, was them proving their unbelief. Because they've already saw ten miracles that got them delivered. Why would they think that there wouldn't be another miracle to, to bring them on out? And so he says they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, now this is what they said, Because there were no graves in Egypt that has taken us away to die in the wilderness, wherefore hast thou dealt with us such to carry us forth out of Egypt? And so they're saying, they're accusing God of bringing them all the way to the Red Sea and trapping them just to be killed. What kind of sense does that make? After God works ten miracles, ten plagues to get you free, why wouldn't you just naturally think, God is on our side. We don't have to worry about them. Why wouldn't you think that? Well, it's the same for you today. God is on your side. Why would you think? Say. Okay? And so, this is what we're supposed to learn. And so what they did is they imputed an evil motive to God that God wasn't planning. God was planning their deliverance, and they were saying that God was planning their death. So in verse 13, it says, And Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Now listen... That's, what we're, that's the attitude we're supposed to, be, supposed to have today. That we can stand still and see God's deliverance. We don't have to do it ourselves. Whenever you try to fix everything yourself and you can't put it in God's hands, that's a lack of trust in God. God is not uh, wood and stone. He is, a, is a, he is the almighty God with a mighty hand. And, and he says this of himself, is anything too hard for me? And that's what we need to know about God, is that He'll act in our behalf. And so He says this, that, that uh, as they continue to murmur, it'd been better that we'd die and serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They didn't believe God at all. And, and so Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And he says, and so this is what he says, which He will show you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. And so Moses already knew what the Lord was going to do. And so the Lord, he said, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. He's saying you're not going to go get your pitchforks and, and axes and go meet them in battle. He said the Lord's going to fight for you and you're just going to be still and hold your peace. So this is the God that we have. We have a God where you can pull up a chair and watch and He'll deliver you. If you're faithful. Okay? And so the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speaking to the children of Israel, that they go forward? But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So after all the Lord has done, they didn't expect deliverance because of unbelief. And that's what happened here. And so they immediately imputed to God that He had a plan to hurt them instead of help them. That's not the God we serve. Okay? Now, 
This is the second time that they tempted God in the wilderness. Blaming and complaining instead of relying on God, the God of miracles. So what happened is in Exodus 15, so Moses brought the children of Israel from the Red Sea. Now listen, God had just parted water for them. And so they've gone out for a few days now into the wilderness. They went out into the wilderness of Shur, and, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So you know their little water pots are starting to get low. And uh, they came to Marah. Now, the, God led them to bitter waters to test them. He wanted to see how they were going to act. And they could not drink of the waters of Marah because they were bitter. And the people murmured against Moses. So here they go again saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which, which when he had cast into the waters... Now this was another miracle that he was working. Trees don't do this to water. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet... And he made for them a statue and ordinance there and proved them. So he was testing them when he brought them to the water. Now he fixed the water, but he wanted to see how they were going to act. Now listen, this is what he did. Okay, the Red Sea is the first time. God brought us here to kill us. Okay, now this time, this is only the second time. So watch, now God wants to change things. He says, I brought you to the water, and I'm going to talk to you. This is what he's doing to us, y'all, right here today. He's having a talk. Okay, and this is what he tells them. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord, thy God, and you will do that which is right in his sight, you'll obey him, do what's right. And you will give ear to his commandments. You're not going to start practicing sin. And keep his statutes. He says, I'm going to put none of these diseases upon you which I put upon the Egyptians. He's telling them, if, if you don't have any faith and trust and reliance upon me, it's not going to work out for you. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And he says, For I am the Lord, the God that healeth thee. Now look what he's saying. If you will obey me, and you'll trust me, and you'll keep my commandments, he says, I'll heal you. But if you don't, you're going down. So he, he said he brought them to this water, and this is what he's trying to do. Early on, he wants to teach them and see if they'll start doing right. So far, they hadn't had them do right, but he says, Okay, I'm going to take a moment and teach my kids. Just like you correct your kids, he was going to try to correct them here and see if he could get the thing going the right direction. He couldn't. Only Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. They trusted and believed God all the way through. And they were the only ones that went in. Okay? So, this is number three. Complaining about God at not doing enough and imputing evil motives to whatever he's doing. Again, in chapter 16. And they took their journey from Elam, and, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin... And in, the, and in between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after the departing out of the land of Egypt, he says, And when the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, say, this is what happened. This is the second month after they came out of, through the Red Sea. The whole congregation was murmuring against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Now this is what, they, this is what they're going to say. Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in, in Egypt. In the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots. And when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. And so this is what happened when they began to get hungry. And the provisions got low. Now listen, don't get me wrong. They had cattle and stuff they went out with. Okay? But they were complaining about God not doing enough. I mean, seriously, if they were really hungry, they could have killed a sheep, a cow, or whatever. But this is, this is what's in their heart. God's not doing enough. We want Him to do what we want Him to do. That's the, plain, that's the complaint here. Okay? And so, He's saying now, well, to try to, try to get God to perform, well, you just brought us out here to, to kill the whole assembly with hunger. And so this is the way that they're, they're responding to God. This is only two months after he worked ten miracles to bring them out, parted the Red Sea, and turned the water sweet. And this, nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. So you know what the difference is, y'all? We have the record. And we read about these miracles. Now, we can get a miracle in our life today, too. But we read about this, and he wants us to read the record and get, and get the results that he got with Joshua and Caleb. That's what he wants us to do. Okay, and so this is the second example, or the third example, of what happened here. 
And then the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they walk in my law or no. So he says, I'm going to give you a new commandment. And he says, this is what's, the way it's going to go down. It shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they shall bring in, and it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So look, he's just saying that in addition to the commandments I've given you already, I'm going to give you this new commandment. I just want to see if you'll do it. Well, they didn't. Okay? They're just not... They're just, this is what we're talking about. He wants to know. He already knows they're sinful. He, he, this is what he wants to know. And he wants to know this about you too. Will you listen to me? The Lord is asking, will you listen to me? Will you keep my commandments and listen to me? Because if you don't, you're going to have the same faith. Will you listen to me? And so this is what he put on them. And this is, this is only a couple of months now. After departing out of the, uh, the second month. After departing out of the land of Egypt. Okay? So this is what it would sound like today. What they're saying. They're taking too long. They got here after we did. Right? This is the way we talk when we sit down to eat. When you, when you made more money, we ate better. When I was a bartender, I lived better. Say, not doing right, but you made more money. Complaining. Things are not good since I'm serving the Lord. They're not as good as they should be since I'm serving the Lord. That's what you're saying to God. This is just not right. Why would you live here and let, this, let us have this bad experience? That's what happened at the water. They were angry that the water wasn't sweet already. Okay? Why are you doing this? Why would you allow this? Why won't you help me? You wouldn't... You would think the food would be better. I heard that at the JMK Ranch when we were going through the line. Because everybody paid their little old $50 for three days. And so they were trying to feed everybody. And they were complaining all down the line. And I was thinking about this. I, I'm telling you, I was thinking about this whenever I was hearing the complaints from my brother. Okay? And so Psalms 127 too, it says, It is useless to, this is what he says, It is useless to work hard for for the food you eat by getting up early and going to bed late, the Lord gives food to those He loves while they sleep. Now you hear me? Listen, He's saying the people that love me, the Joshua and Caleb's of this world, He said, I'm planning their next meal while they're asleep. But the wicked, they get up early and go to bed late trying to get it to self. And the Bible tells us He's planning your next meal while you sleep. Okay? And so this is, this is the real God here. The one they're talking about is a God that they invented. And, the, and you know what? The God they invented did to them exactly what they were complaining. And he says, whatever you complain, that's what I'm going to do. That's not the way we get God to perform. We're not supposed to try to get God to perform. If we have faith and trust and reliance upon God, He plans your life while you sleep. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? Now, Jesus suffered all the while, but gives freedom. Listen, He went 40 days without eating. You know how long they'd go? Three days before they acted like that. He went 40 days when He was being tested of the devil. When He was up on the cross, He wanted some water and they gave Him vinegar. Nobody suffered like Jesus, and He got way worse than what they got. Okay? In Matthew 5, this is what he says. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, I'll fill you with all you can stand. He's offering this to you. In John 4, he said, whoever drinks this water, he says, whosoever drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the kind of water he wants to give you. See, he's not the God that wants to give you better water to drink. He might see how you act when you get a taste of a bad experience. But he's watching you to see if you're going to get to be a Joshua or Caleb when he rewards you without you asking for nothing. When he gives you his very best without you even asking for anything. That's what he did for them. They didn't have to ask for it. They went through the same wilderness testing the children of Israel did. But when it was time, he gave and gave and gave and gave and they didn't ask for any of it. And that's the way it is with us today. And so in John 7, 37, 38, in the last day, the, gay, the, the day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 
And he that believeth on me, as the scripture that said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is what he's offering you, the very best water that he has to give you. Now we may have a few better experiences getting tested along the way. But he's offering and he has in reward for us his very best. That's the Jesus that I know. Okay? Now, this is number four. Murmuring and complaining and putting God to the test, expecting God to perform. This is what they're doing. And in Exodus 16, And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, In the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And he says, And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, in the morning bread to the full, for the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we that your murmurings are, against, are not against us, but against the Lord? So listen, this was the correct action. They had been getting bread, but they hadn't got flesh as of yet. So the Lord let them get tired of it. He was going to see how they were going to act. Okay? Well, they acted terrible. The Lord brought us out here to kill us with hunger, and there's nothing to eat but this bread. That's the way they were talking. But listen, what did Jesus teach us? If your children asked for bread, would, would any of you give them a stone? Or if a child asked for a fish, would you give them a snake? And he says, even though you're, you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. So how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those that ask Him? You know what? We're supposed to pray through it. You know, He's our dad. When you get tired of bread, you don't complain and say, God brought you out here to do evil to you. That's not how you get it. You ask. You tell God how you love Him and you tell Him how you would like to have something other than bread. But you don't act like that. You don't break His commandments and put Him to the test and all that. Our God loves us. If we need something, we ask. Okay? Now, number five, never following His instruction. So six days you shall gather and on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there shall be none. And it came to pass that... that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And this is what the Lord said to Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? For the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth, giveth you on the sixth day bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the seventh. He wanted to give them a day of rest, and he just wanted them to listen and do what he said. And it's the same today. If you need something from the Lord, follow His instruction. Keep His commandment. He'll do anything for us because He loves us. But the Bible says the double-minded man is not receiving any help. No help. You have, you have to return your heart to Him. He wants your heart. And you know, when we're not in violation of one's commandment, we're just in rebellion. We cannot get that help we need in rebellion. Rebellion is bad. It's what the angels did. They rebelled. And he's not looking for that. He's looking for those that humble themselves under his hand. That's what he's looking for. Alright? So, this is what we got. The correct action during the testing period was to carefully follow his instruction and commandments. That's what we're supposed to do. Never speak against him and never complain. Pray, trust, rely on God and have faith and expect Him to act in the behalf of those that wait. That's what He does. Above all, above all, learn to love God and each other as we pass through enemy territory. That's the mission. This is the mission. We pray through enemy territory, we trust God, we rely upon God, and, uh, and we have faith and expect Him to act in our behalf. And we learn to love like He loves. That's our mission as we pass through enemy territory. Because this is not our home. So this is what we've been talking about right here. But let him ask in faith. This is a person that has faith and trust in God. Nothing wavering. For he that wa wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So he doesn't want that instability. He doesn't want that double-mindedness double -minded from you. And so it's not a stalemate. You're just losing. You're going to continue to deteriorate. And he's going to continue to give you over to the devil until you are submissive to him and you're following his law. And then he will help you. And that's the way that it is. 
That's the way it's always been. That's the way it is. Number six, getting angry, complaining, and putting evil to God. Exodus 17. The whole community of the Israelites left the desert of sin and traveled from place to place as the Lord commanded them, and they camped and uh, repped them. But there was no water for the people to drink. So they complained to Moses by saying, Give us water to drink. Moses said, Why are you complaining to me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses and asked, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? And what, what it, was it to make us, our children, and our livestock die of thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do to these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Bring some of the leaders of Israel with you and go to where the people can see you and take the staff you used to strike the Nile River. And of course he gave them water out of a rock. Now listen, this is the problem here. This is a God of miracles. Why do you think he's going to let you die of thirst? Why do you think he would bring you out there to kill you? Okay? He gave them water out of a rock because he can do anything. But he was watching them. The murmuring revealed a rebellious, ungrateful, self-centered, and rebellious heart. That's what, that's what they were showing them. He was letting them show them his heart. Show him his, their hearts. And that's what happened when they, when they had a bad experience. This is the way they talked and this is the way they acted. A humble heart of faith would pray in expectation of a miracle because God loves us. He not only gives you water out of a rock, but He gives you living water where you never thirst again in a spiritual state. He gives and gives and gives. That's the God that we serve. Now, we continue to look at this 1 through 7. So they could not enter in because of unbelief is what the Lord said in 1 Corinthians 10 and, and Hebrews 3 and 4. So He says, I'll be standing in front of you there by a rock on Mount Oreb and strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. And Moses did this while the leaders of Israel watched him. So he named the place Massa, which is testing, and Meribah, which is complaining, because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord. So they were trying to put God to the test. They're complaining, thinking, well, if we act, if we act stupid, then God's going to perform and do what we want. But see, they lost their inheritance. They didn't get to go into the land of rest because they were behaving this way. This is rebellion, is what that is. So they were asking this, is the Lord with us or not? That's their attitude. Well, the Lord has already said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You're not supposed to be questioned whether the Lord is, is with you or not. If your life is not working out, you need to take a look at it and see where you're in rebellion and where you're being double-minded. Because when our heart belongs to the Lord, we can have anything we pray within His will. And I'm just telling you that is my experience. I've asked Him to help me do a number of things during my own trials. And He's done them all. But the things that I was asking Him to, to teach me is things like, I want to learn to love like you love. And I want to see people the way you see them. I want to see sin the way you see it. I, wanted to ask, I asked Him for a clean heart. I asked him for a lot of things. I asked him to take away anger out of my heart and to teach me to give all the vengeance to him. He's done every one of those. And I felt my heart changing as I prayed for those things. He's done everything that I've asked him to do. But I'm not in rebellion to him. And I'm not double-minded to him. And you can have that too. I know you can have that because that's just who we serve. And so they were asking, is God with us or not? Now this is what is written in Psalms 95 about this, y'all. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel in front of the Lord, our Maker, because He is our God and we are the people in His care. That's what we are, the people in His care. The flock that He leads, that's what we are. If you would only listen to Him today. That's the whole problem. If there's any problem in the relationship, it's right here. This is what He is to us. We are His people. We're in His care. The people that He leads. But if you'll only listen. If you're not listening, you're not getting this from Him. He needs us to submit to Him. He needs us to follow His commandments. He needs, and this is what He's telling us in Psalms 8. Don't be stubborn like the people were in Meribah. Like the time at Massa in the desert. He's saying don't be stubborn and rebellious 
against one of His commandments, you need to submit and behave like Christians are supposed to behave. Then you can get the help you're desiring. Your ancestors challenged me and tested me there, although they had seen what I had done. And this is what he's saying. All those miracles that I did in Egypt and those two years of testing, and even in the 40 years of the wilderness, he said, that was for you to see what I can do. He's saying, look, I can do anything. There's nothing that's not too hard for me. And he didn't quit doing miracles. He can, do, he can give you your miracle. But he's saying, if you're acting like the children of Israel, then you're not getting anything but what you're saying. And the way you're acting, you're getting, you're getting your reward for that. He'll do unto you to what you're, whatever you're saying is what you're getting. But, so, but Joshua and Caleb didn't get any of that. They got it all. All of it. And that's what he's looking for in this testing time is the Joshua and Caleb's. So they had seen what he could do with his hand. And he said, for 40 years I was disgusted with those people. So I said, there, there are people whose hearts continue to stray. And they've not learned my ways. Now listen, y'all, he's talking to us. When you stray and are not learning his ways, you're just like they were. He said, this is why I angrily took the solemn oath. They're never coming into my place of rest. We don't want to be those people. We are to take note of His mighty works the Lord does in our lives and learn to expect deliverance from a mighty and faithful God. But we are not going to be in rebellion when that happens. I'm just telling you. You're not going to be in rebellion to any of His commandments when that happens. You're going to be submitting to Him, making those changes that you're supposed to make. To, to, to you're supposed to, the, the fruit of the Spirit you're supposed to be having and not the works of the flesh. That's what's going to be going on in your life when you get all the help that you need. Okay? It's not a stalemate. You're just losing. You're just losing. All right? Fit for the kingdom of God. In Hebrews 13, he says, Don't love money, but be happy with what you have, because God has said, I'll never abandon you or leave you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. This is the attitude that we're supposed to be able to have, because God is faithful. But again, in James 1.4, where he talks about the double-minded man, he says, Endure until your testing is over. Then you will be mature and complete, and you won't have need of anything. He'll take care of it. You won't need anything if you will endure till your testing is over. You can't be in rebellion to him, though. You can't do that. And so, in Romans 5.3-5, through 5, this verse has been speaking to me for weeks now. And I talked about it during the Lord's Supper. He says... But that's not all. He says, but we glory in tribulations, what the King James Version says, when we are suffering. We know that suffering creates endurance. That this is what He needs from you. He needs to know that you can go through a testing time and endure. Because when the tribulation time comes, He'll pick His Joshua and Caleb's from the enduring people. And they will teach people how to get through it. They'll lead them through it. And that's what he needs to know. Are you, are you learning to endure? Because, and this endurance is going to create the character that he needs for you to be Joshua and Caleb. And the character creates confidence. And he says, and we're not ashamed to have this confidence because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. You just got to feel this. You got to feel that this love of God being poured out in our hearts, it is what he's about. But he needs you to step up and be this person with endurance and character and confidence. And the love of God can get you there. And that's why He told me to talk on it. I'm just letting you know. But see, I went back and listened to all that. And I was too frustrated. Two years ago, I'd sit in here when this thing was, was a lot fuller than it is now. And I was preaching. I listened to some, some sermons here last month. I was so happy and I was joking around. And I've been, I went back and listened to my later ones, and I was frustrated. I could hear it in my voice. And I said, he gave me the love of God to talk about. I don't know how I could even penetrate because of my frustration. I could hear it. So this is where we're at. We're supposed to learn the endurance and have the character that's built from that and the confidence because we're in touch with the love of God. The shit is poured out into our hearts by this Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is when the relationship is right. When we can endure and have character. The characteristics of a Christian. Okay? 
Number seven, Israel turned to the pleasures of sin in a crisis and were unfaithful to the Lord. In Exodus 32, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Make us a new God. We want to get rid of this other one. He's not performing like we want him to. So we're going to invent one. Maybe it's a God that allows you to commit the commandment, to, to violate the commandments that you want to violate. But that's not the God of the Bible. And so he said, Make us a new God when shall, when, that shall go before us. For all, as for this Moses, this that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So yeah, he's been up there for a while. I think over 40 days or something. And they're just ready to give up on Moses and the God that, that, that he served and get him a new God. And so he says, And they rose up early in the, mar in the morning and they just offered up these burnt offerings and brought peace offerings to this golden calf that they made. And it says the people s sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now listen, they were singing, when Moses came out of this, they says they were drinking and singing and naked. And the modern version just says they were having an orgy because of what the Scripture says about them committing fornication. And so this is what was going on. They were drinking and singing and dancing. And Joshua, Joshua said, there's war in the camp. He said, no, it's not the voice of, of war I hear. It's the voice of singing. And they come down there, and Moses was so angry when he saw all these naked people dancing around drunk that he just threw down the, ten, the tablets that God wrote with his own finger and broke them. It's terrible, man. It's terrible. And so they turned, he said, they, this is what the Lord said. The Lord said to Moses, Get thee down for, for thy people, which thou brought us out of. He's not saying my people right now that I brought out. He said, your people that you brought out of the land of Egypt, they've corrupted themselves. And they've turned aside quickly out of the way which I've commanded them. They're in violation of my commandments. He says, they have made them a molten calf. They have worshipped it. They sacrificed to it and said, this be by the gods, O Israel, that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So this is what they were doing when he came down and saw it. What it sounds like today. I'm tired of waiting on God to help. God's taking too long. About time something happened. I need the distraction. If I'm disobedient, maybe God will help. Then I'll come back. This is Israel. Okay? They complained about the provisions in number 8. When the people complained, it, dis it displeased, the, displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled, and the, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. The people cried unto Moses, and Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place uh, Taborah because of the fire of the Lord that burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? And so the, it's going from one thing to another. They're murmuring. They're not complaining about the food. And they're remembering all the buffet they had when they were slaves. And they said, We remember the fish we did eat in Egypt freely, and the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But he says, Now our soul is dried away, and there's nothing, to, nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. You remember the way they talked when they first tasted it? They talked about how delicious it was when it fell from heaven, you know. It's this little round thing that tastes like it might have had a little honey in it, and it was so sweet and delicious, and, and now they're like, there's nothing eat but his bread. And so I mean, they're, they're really, their hearts have really turned into this just complaining, rebellious uh, people. And, um, and you know, this is, this is what it has become. But the Lord says... You know, talk to me about it. That's not what they're doing. They're complaining and rebelling and not walking in His commandment. And that is not fixing the relationship. It's not getting them fish to eat. Okay? It's not getting them anything. He's saying, whatever you're complaining, that's what I'm going to do to you. But it's not what He was planning. He was planning to bring them to a place of rest that was flowing with food and ready to eat. And the manna stopped falling the day that they entered into Canaan and ate of the fruit. He had a plan. He needed to know if this is the people he wanted to bring there or not. And he needs to know that about you right now. He needs to know he has a plan for you.
There's a rest that remains for the people of God. And he needs to know if you're that person he wants to bring there to partake of it or not. He wants to know if you're fit for the kingdom. He needs to know. And so you're going through some testing. Okay? Number nine, they complained about the leader God chose. Now, Myra and Aaron began to criticize Moses because he was married to a woman of Sudan. And they asked, did the Lord speak only through Moses? Did he also speak through us? And so now they're starting to get this attitude that we should have more power and more authority among the people and like be up there with Moses. And the Lord heard the complaint. And he says that Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aram and Milan, he spoke to all three of them, and he says, all three of you come to the tent meeting. So all three of them came. All three of you come to the tent of meeting. So they all came. And the Lord came down in a column of smoke, and he stood in the entrance of the tent. And he called to Aaron and Myra, and, he, and they both came forward. And he says, you listen to me. When there are prophets of the Lord among you, I make myself known to them in visions, or I speak to them in dreams. He says, but it's not that way. That's not the way it is with Moses. We may get a dream or a vision today. But you see, when he gives it to us, he says it's in riddles. It's in riddles, you've got to figure it out. So it may not be, it may not run just like, just like it's, it's plain as day like a video, but it may run like a video, but you're going to have to figure out what it means. You're going to have to make the parallel. See? And so this is what he's saying that I make myself known to them in dreams or in visions. He says, but it's not that way with Moses. He's the most faithful, faithful person in my household. He says, I speak to him face to face. And I speak to him plainly. He's the only one that I tell things to plainly. The rest of you get riddles. And any time I've get a, got a dream from the Lord, it's been a riddle. A riddle to be solved. And you too, some of you that had them. He sees the form of the Lord... Why were you afraid to criticize my servant Moses? Why weren't you afraid? He's saying he sees my form when he comes into the tent. He says, why weren't you afraid to criticize him? And he was angry with them, so he left. And then we also have the rebellion of Korah that I'm not going to go over today for the lack of time. But, you know, after this even, when Myram and Aaron got in trouble, Korah and some of his people that were Levites got together and they rebelled, wanted some of the authority and, and things that Moses had. So it happened beyond this even. Now, listen, we're getting down towards the end of this thing. We just want to look at some ideals. This is number 10. They imputed lies to God and did not believe the promise. So, Numbers 13, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give the children of Israel. So this is what happened. They went into the land. They searched it 40 days, and they come out. And so this is what they, this is what they did. They showed them the fruit of the land. See, that they brought out of it. They brought some cluster of grapes between two poles. They were so big. And he says, When we came unto the land that thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. So they're saying this part of what God said is true. And this is the fruit of it. And then they said, But this part, God said, is not true. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and they're very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, which were the giants like Goliath. And so this is the way the people responded to that. Say, that they, it says that they, they lifted up their voice and wept all night when they heard that. See, they didn't believe God. But see, this is what happened. Caleb stepped in, and he stilled the people. Because they spoke up saying, look, there's walled cities and giants in there. And he says, he began on to say that, that we saw ourselves, we looked like grasshoppers, and we were like grasshoppers to them too. And so, so the Moses, this Caleb, he steals the people before Moses. And he said, let us go up at once and possess it because we're able to overcome it because God's with us. We saw the miracles that our God can work. But look, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people because we're stronger than we are. But God, they didn't have God. They left God out of the equation. They're looking at what's before them with the giants in the walled cities like Jericho, which fell down flat 40 years later when their children went in. Okay? And so they're saying, we can't do it. And so it says, they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land though which we have gone to search it is a land, is, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, 
It's a dangerous place. People are dying there. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. They were giants. And, we saw, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which are come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were the, we and so we were in their sight as well. So this is all the congregation, chapter 14, lifted their voice and, and, and they cried. And they, the people wept all that night. They're behaving as people that do not believe. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, We would, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said, Let us just make a captain and go back. All of this unbelief. And Moses there fell on their faces before this, the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel and Joshua and Caleb. They rent their clothes. They didn't want nothing to do with that. And listen, Moses sinned right at the door of Canaan and didn't get to go in. That can be us too. We can live our lives and be like this faithful servant and get right up to the door and not go in. He didn't get to go. Joshua and Caleb did. Now, choices and consequences. They, talking about Joshua and Caleb, spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is exceeding good land. The, if the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into the land and give it to us, the land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of this land, for they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us, fear them not. This is what they said. Believe God. Trust, have faith, rely upon God. This is the way you come to the land. Faith, trust, reliance. This is what was in their voice. They're saying, hey, don't rebel. We're fixing to lose this. And they did lose it. They wouldn't listen to Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb did not lose it. And they, did, they got their years restored to them so they could go enjoy it. So all the congregation just said, stone them with stones. And so listen, this is what happened. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle. The Lord let them work it out to see what they was going to do. He let them talk about it to see if they would believe or not. And He was watching. And He's watching you too. He's watching to see how you're going to act and see if you're going to believe or not. Because He has the same power to deliver today as He did then. And He's watching. We're in the wilderness testing before the time of rest. We're in it. And then the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation and my nation than they. That was his first solution. But Moses, even after all this, said, just forgive them one more time. If not, just block me out of the book. Man. Putting this up on the line right there. Mm. So what it sounds like today, this is too much to deal with. The problem's too big to fix. I give up. I can't deal with this anymore. I'm afraid of whatever. I can't do this. That's what it sounds like today. But Jeremiah 32 verse 27 says... I am the Lord God of all humanity. Nothing is too hard for me. If you're not delivered, it's because of your rebellion. You're in rebellion. You need to come in under His hand and submit to Him. This is timeless. This is timeless. His power, His deliverance is timeless. Only those who believe and trust God entered into His rest. In Numbers 14, verse 19 to 24, Moses said, Pardon, I beseech thee, this iniquity of this people, according to the, to, to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even to now, this is the talk he's having to God. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as true as I live, all the earth is going to be filled with my glory. Listen, He's going to do it with or without you. He's going to fill His this earth with His glory. Just like He did when He brought them into the land of Canaan, He's going to do it again 
whenever this thousand years kicks off. It's coming full circle, I'm telling you. It's coming full circle. He is going to do this. He's going to fill this earth with His glory. I'm telling you, it's coming. He says, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear to the fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. Now this is the way he talked to them. Now these modern virgins treat me with contempt, despise me. That's the kind of provoking that he's talking about. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land where until he went and his seed shall possess it. He went in, he saw it, he believed. He wasn't with them in the way they behaved. You get what you murmured. Now this is what he tells them. Tomorrow turn you and get into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord said unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard their murmurs of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. And say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, will I do to you. Your caucuses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into this land concerning which I swear, swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb and the son of Je and Caleb and Joshua is what, what we want to say about that. Them is the only two that saw it. Consequences of not learning anything. Verse 25 to 35. But your little ones, which you said would be a prey, them will I bring in, and, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your, whole, your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days which he searched out the land, a day for a year, they went in and searched it forty days, they'll go in the wilderness for forty years. Even forty days... Each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know the breach of promise. The Lord, ha the Lord has said, I will surely do it unto all this evil, evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In the wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. This is what Psalms 106.43 says. He rescued them many times, but they continue to plot rebellion against Him and to sink deeper because of their sin. You've got to understand, being in violation to His commandment, is, is rebellion. So you can either stop the rebellion or you can, see, you can sink deeper and deeper and deeper into your sin until there's no hope. It's going to be a choice. I'm telling you, it's your choice. Today, if you will hear His voice, we can put a stop to that. Now, from the promise, from the one chosen to enter God's rest, this is what Joshua, this is what the Lord said to Joshua when He brought him out and 40 years later, he was going to lead the people in. This is what the Lord said to him. The Lord spake unto Joshua, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Do you hear him? This is the faithful one. It's time to pay. Payday. Joshua went through all that wilderness testing. He was faithful. And now this is what the Lord is saying. It's time to pay up. He says, Nobody's going to ever be able to stand before you. As I was with Moses... I'm going to be with you that way. He went through the wilderness testing first. You're going through wilderness testing. As I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. This is the Lord. Be strong and of good courage. That's what He needs from us. For unto this people shall thy divide inheritance of the land. He said, you're going to, I'm choosing you to bring them to it. To bring them to their inheritance. Only be thou strong and very courageous. He says it again. That thou mayest observe to do according to the law. Again, it comes back to don't come into rebellion to me. You need to keep the laws that I give you. Okay? Which my servant Moses, which, I, which Moses my servant commanded thee not to turn away the right or the left hand of it. That thou mayest prosper and whithersoever thou goest. And so he's saying your prosperity is going to be based upon your obedience to my law. And you need to be very strong and courageous to do what I've told you and to lead this people. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandments, see, and will not hearken to thy words, put him to death. This is very important to the Lord. Okay? Only be thou strong and of good courage. So he says that three times, be strong and of good courage. We need to see that he's going to be with us, see. But look at what he's saying. 
that you may observe the law, not rebel against the commandment, that you may prosper whether thereso thou goest. It's connected. You not being in rebellion to His commandment is connected to Him being with you. Okay, that's what we want to show from that. And we only got a couple more slides, y'all. I thought I'd get away with a lot more because it's a lot of reading. Examples of unbelief and belief. Okay? Everyone, didn't, everyone who didn't learn to have faith, trust, faith in God, trust Him to take care of everything by His power, rely on His faithfulness to provide, expect deliverance and healing, they died in the wilderness. That's our mission. That's what we're supposed to be doing down here as we pass through enemy territory. Faith, trust, reliance, expect deliverance, or die in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb trusted God, and the Lord brought them to the promised land, put them over His people, caused them not to age, gave them an inheritance, and delivered them from all their enemies. They did not complain when, tr when tried. They didn't murmur when they tired of bread. They didn't impute fault to God or an evil motive to Him when things were different than what they expected. Neither did they have to ask for any of the rewards. The God of love showered them with the rewards on His own after they proved faithful. So this is what Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. He's a rewarder, y'all. That's what He is. But we have to go through our wilderness testing. We have to be Joshua and Caleb to get this kind of relationship with God where He does these things for us. We have to have the faith, the trust, the reliance, and expect deliverance and healing before we come to this place of reward. That's what we have to do. Okay? That's all I'm going to share with you today. I'll turn it back over to the brother. Well, I guess I'm in charge at this moment. <laughs>